Corbia. Um, we're clear back. Sorry, it's a 25 minute session clock now. We're based in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, that, you know, we manufacture this unit right here in Nashville, New Hampshire. So everything is, uh, is made in the U.S. Um, we were founded in 2009 as an audit system. So we started our, uh, you know, in this wonderful industry auditing other voting systems, uh, kind of in the wake of the, the 2000 election in Florida. Our founder went down there, started working with uh, some of the counties like Palm Beach and, and Leon and Bay County uh, that were kind of on the, the, front of, the front end of that. And they asked them, you know, what is it you know, that got you in this mess? What do you, what do you think you need you know, to prevent this from happening you know, in the future? And, and the, the main thing that they said was transparency. You know, we feel like we don't have visual, you know, visibility into these numbers. And then when, you know, when people ask us to do a recount, you know, we're surprised, right? So keep that in mind as we go through this. I want to show you guys kind of the, the system and how it would apply to, to North Carolina. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to drill into kind of the back end of our system, which is really what makes us unique and different. So this is the precinct setup. So uh, there's essentially two components. You've got a precinct tabulator, which is you know similar to the M100s or, uh, or the express votes. You know. Uh, and then this is our touchscreen voting system uh, for accessibility. They bulk weigh in the range of 30 pounds each. We, they come with a, a, a traveling you know, transport case with wheels and, a, and an arm, so they're easy to, to move around. Uh, the cast precinct tabulator has a collapsible ballot bag. This will hold about 700, uh, 700 ballots, but we also have a larger stand standalone ballot box, which will hold 2,500. So the nice thing about this is it costs about 40 bucks as opposed to the the big you know, kind of garbage can ballot boxes that that cost about a thousand. Uh, and because our system is is software based. We don't require any physical uh, physical separation of the ballots. Everything's done digitally, and we'll we'll talk about that more as we get to the back end. Um, this machine will tabulate ballots, you know, anywhere from two and a half to four seconds. So, you know, it, it won't be the bottleneck. Um, uh, we kind of advocate that you, know, you set up, you know, voting booths and primarily hand out paper ballots that they mark. You know, they submit them through here. It'll notify on overvotes and uh, blank ballots. Um, and then the touchscreen voting system is for folks with accessibility needs. These are, uh, let me go back. Everything with the exception of this uh, shell here is a commercial off-the-shelf component. So our screen, our scanner, our battery, our processor, they're all uh, available from a source other than us. We think that's important because, you know, one of the other things we heard from, you know, the people we worked with early in the evolution of the company was, I'm tired of being controlled by my voting system then, right? I want options. I want to be able to do things the way I want to do them. I want to be able to source things, you know, from other places than them. I don't want a single source because then, you know, they've got the power. So we don't have any proprietary paper stock, we don't have any proprietary toner, we don't have any proprietary you know, printer paper or anything like that. So it, it helps you guys to keep costs down and control you know, the vendor as opposed to vice versa. Uh, I'm going to walk through a uh, accessible voting session just so you guys have got a, a sense of how that works. And, and again, this would be primarily for voters with disabilities that you know don't want to or, or can't mark a paper ballot on, on their own. So a uh, voter would come in, they would uh, you know check in with the poll worker, they would uh, ask to you know, use the, the, the accessible voting system. The poll worker would come in and log the voter in to make sure that they got the correct ballot style. Okay? So if uh, what this is doing is it's, it's showing all the ballot styles that are available on this machine. 
the poll worker would select the appropriate ballot style for the voter and then validate that the, the correct ballot style was activated with the voter. Okay, this is Demo City 1A, is that right? It's good. Okay. Once they hit vote, they walk away and the voter uh, begins the session. Uh, they can um, they can pick languages. I don't know if you guys have language requirements here in North Carolina. We have up to eight languages that we can translate the ballot into. Um, we have a setting here, so if the voter wants to increase the, the font size, if they want to adjust the contrast on the screen, we have the ability to do that. Uh, this, is, this interface is called the Anywhere Ballot. It was developed by the Center for Civic Design on a, uh, a, an Election Assistance Commission grant. We are the only ones, with the exception of Los Angeles County, that has used this in a, in a commercial application. Uh, so again, you know, we try to leverage things that have been done that are kind of industry standard as much as possible. Um, voting session is ready. We've got multiple areas for uh, instructions if you choose to use them. And then the voter would go through and mark their selections just by touching the boxes. This is a vote by two. If I undervote this, oops, it's going to let me know, hey, there's, this is a vote for two, you only voted for one. Um, I'm going to say, yeah, it's fine. If I try to overvote it, it's going to tell me, hey, you can't do that on this machine. That's okay. Once I'm done, it's going to pull up all the selections. It's going to let me preview my selections before I print it. And if I'm okay with that, I hit print. It's going to make. It's going to ask me one more time before I print the ballot, so I don't have to spoil that. Uh, are you good with this? I say yes, and then it'll print uh, that ballot off uh, regular stock. We have. I believe we have a number of types of ballot stock uh, certified with the state, but because we grew up as an audit system, we have a lot higher tolerance for you know, different types of stock. So it allows you, again, allows you to keep the, the cost of, of, the, of the ballots down, uh, which can be, you know, which can add up over 10 years. This, uh, this printer here will duplex up to a 20 inch ballot. Uh, it, uh, we, we can do, I believe, up from an eight and a half by five to an eight and a half by 22, uh, depending on, on your, your regulations. We also have the ability to do ballot sets. So let's say you have a 22 inch ballot, but this machine won't print a 22 inch ballot. This will print a, you know, two eight and a half by 11 ballots that the machine will read as identical. And when I show you the, the way we kind of dissect things and interpret the, the voted marks, it'll make more sense. But, uh, but this ballot has been marked it's identical to the ballot that we're going to hand out in the precinct. Uh, the machine tabulates from the oval. It doesn't uh, tabulate from any barcodes. So what you see is is what you know is being read, and it is the most auditable. Uh, we feel that's the most auditable way to do things. Um, ballots can be submitted in any orientation. Uh, you just place it in in the tray there. Usually takes about two and a half to four seconds for the, the ballot to be accepted, and then it'll increment the cards accepted and thank you for voting. Any questions so far? Put it in and it's crooked jam that machine. Yes, so if that happens, the poll worker has the ability. We've got a couple, you know, we've got a, uh, an opening here where they can open it up and, and unjam it. Um, we also, um, so the ballot bag on the, on the back is connected with security seals. And then we've got, we've got a zipper enclosure that kind of secures this. And what a lot of our clients do is they'll put a padlock on it, a combination padlock. So if it does you know, jam where they can't get to it from this front box, they can open up that back and they can pull it out the back. And spoil it. And that's your question. Can the ballot be introduced? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, that's the primary method we advocate for, for marking the ballot. So let me grab. So there's also a 
a blank ballot. So this is what we normally be handed out in the, in the precinct. Mark, now this is Mark this. No. Um, and I'll okay. overvote one of them so you can see what that does. That's how you turn it on. We got this up. Yeah. 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 That's, so if you see the tablecloth, you know, we're very we're very aware of how many ways you can mark an oval. We're, we're going to get into a little bit uh, a little bit more about that uh, when we talk about the back end of, of how we how we tabulate and kind of uh, present the results of an election. So this is uh, this is an overvoted ballot. When I overvote, it's going to say, "Hey, the emergency levy, you know, measure on here, you." You marked you know, with more selections than than we asked. For. So we are required to ask them if they want to submit it that way, knowing that those votes won't count, or if they want to return it. So we're going to return that, and in this case, they would spoil this ballot, you know, take it to the poll worker, and get a new ballot and mark that. So, is that actually a question? Yeah. So you know, get yeah. What we provide with the system is a red ballot bag, which would be an emergency ballot box, right? You know, one of the things that, that you know, as we were going to, we started as a vote by mail system because. Uh, there are no commercial off-the-shelf precinct scanners, you know, anywhere. Uh, but one of the things as we were going through the, the exercise of developing the precinct scanner was, you know, there's been a lot of very highly technical, proprietary ways to do really easy things, right? You're capturing, you know, the tabulator won't work, and now you've got, you know, you got to capture something, and rather than build it into some proprietary thing, you've got to come to us to work. Just create a secure box that those things can be submitted into until you get those back online. This actually uh, has a four-hour battery backup, you know, so uh, so if you lose power, it's still going to work uh, at full capacity for four hours. Hopefully, you'll get the power turned on. But um, but we try to do things in the, the simplest, most cost-effective way to you know, to make sure you guys can keep cost down. And, you know, and manage it long term. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. Did, uh, so the other thing, and we didn't bring the high speed scanner, but uh, we have three versions of high speed scanners that we put through certification. They're all commercial off the shelf scanners, they're made by Fujitsu. Uh, they scan anywhere from 6,000 to 1,200 ballots an hour. Uh, and that's primarily uh, for vote by mail jurisdictions. We, I mentioned we started uh, in the vote by mail space. Our largest client currently is uh, King County, Seattle, Washington. And King County told us that they paid for our system in less than two elections with the cost savings they gained from using our system. So in King County, they had to remake. So if, if the tabulator doesn't read a ballot, you know, so, and it, it, if you can imagine with 1.2 million ballots being submitted by mail, you know, there's a lot that get chewed up, coffee spilled on them, marked wrong. Uh, with most of the other systems, they have to physically take that, you know, take that voter's ballot, the ballot that the voters submit. You know, remake you know, set that aside. Remake that ballot with the voter intent that they interpret from looking at that ballot, and then submit that through the voting system. They estimated that cost them about ten dollars a ballot to do. We eliminated that process, so they went from three hundred thousand ballots that they had to remake using another system to ten ballots that they had to remake in the following election, and. The cost that was that was saved from from not having to do that paid for our system in less than two elections. So if that's kind of the the power that we feel like modern technology brings to the, the system. And you know, there's been a lot of processes in the elections industry, not just in North Carolina, or, you know, but but in places all over the country that people have just assumed is law or the way you have to do things or the only way it can be done. 
And what we you know, try to tell people is there's an easier way to do it, right? There's a cheaper way to do this. And there's a way to do this with greater integrity for the entire process. And I, and I think, you know, this year and moving forward, that's going to be more and more clear. So, any other questions about the precinct setup or the, you know, the, the scanning of the balance? Okay. I want to show you. So, we design all of our machines. So, this is. This is our tabulation system. Um, so when, so I did, I didn't mention this. When the result, the ballots have been scanned, uh, all these ballot images are stored on two redundant encrypted hard drives in this machine. And uh, at the end of the election, one of those, you know, thumb drives would would be brought back to the headquarters, and then all the the thumb drives would be aggregated into a sing single system that is offline in the, the headquarters, you know, to, to, to essentially get the complete results of the election. What most systems provide at, at that point is, is this kind of perspective, right? This is the contest here, the candidates are my, that's how many votes is right? When we you know, started going around Florida, you know, this was what they said was part of the ballot, right? We're given a number, we don't know what's behind that number. I just want to be clear about one thing. We just have to uh, assume that it's correct. Right? This ballot also has a barcode. No machine in here, right? or anyone in here. What we've done is we've taken all the ballot images that we've created and we've added layers of depth behind that number. So you guys now have evidence behind the number to defend, you know, and, and kind of, uh, Show the you know, the math behind the interpretation. So if I explain on, so what this is, it says in 2016 in Bay County, Florida, and if I click on that number, it's going to bring up the 100 least confident votes out of 62,000 that we counted. And it's going to it's going to basically dissect every ballot and pull up every oval that we counted in this contest. So. So that is every voted mark on 62,000 ballots that we counted. And what we're showing, you can see here up at the top, we've got filters, and I've got the filter set for 100 just because it's the 62,000 ovals can get a little. The presumption there is that the other ballots were blank. Well, what, we, we, what we're showing you on this page is. So there's 88,000 ballots total that with this contest on it, and we're showing you every one. If you wanted to see every one of those, you could see it. So these are the, the votes that we counted, these are the overvotes that we counted, and these are all the ones that didn't have a vote or, or any marks in there. But we show you those as well, right? But we're going to start here. So, so we, we rank them by confidence, and we only show the top 100 because, you know, or we only show the bottom 100 because the top 100s are like, you know, black ovals like the ballot marking devices is used. You know, it's fully filled in, and uh, there's not much to see. But this little guy down here at the bottom, you know, that's the, the least confident vote that we count. Right? Now, if you wanted to, to to drill into that further, if you just hover over that, it's going to pull up the whole contest there. Right. So now you're looking at the entire presidential contest, and you're going to see, you know, what else is in there. You know, is there anything in there that I need to be aware of? And if you really want to drill in even further, with another click of that mouse, you can pull up the entire ballot. Card. And we we scan all of our ballots in 200 DPI grayscale, which you know, DPI is dots per inch. Grayscale means we're going to show we're going to show white, black, and gray. The other, the other voting system, is, is, as far as I understand, and we know a little bit about them because we audit their systems, most of them use black and white. And I think the majority of them are 100 DPI black and white. So that means if it's not, you know, if, the, if the system doesn't read it as white, it reads it as black. But there is no in-between. So a light mark is either not there or it's dark. Right? 
So what we you know, we chose grayscale because it shows more nuance and from a you know we want you to visually inspect these ballots if you need to without having to go in and sit through the paper and, and have to you know, go through that. So uh, these were the votes that we counted, but to your point, you know what else is in there, right? So the next column that we show is the overvotes. And you know, in a close contest, this is what this is where votes will be picked up or, or potentially changed. So uh, you know, this one here, if I hover over this, that's a pretty clear open, right? You know, that's that's textbook overvote. Right? <laughs> right? Some people just can't follow the text. But if we look at the next one on the list, if I hover over that, what do you think that is? Yeah. We're not telling you what to do with that. We counted this as an open. What are we supposed to be looking at? You're looking at this, this right here. Yeah. So we counted that as an over. Yeah, we're not telling, I mean, every other system in this room is going to count this as an open. But in a close contest, these are the things that you want to know about. Because these are the things that, you know, when they pull that ballot, when they find that ballot, there's going to be a discussion. And, yes. So you're looking for a check with the school of the first referred to Phil. Well, that's where you get into, I mean. That's why the higher election is. That's why they hire election and and you know, what we give you guys the ability to do is to do this at scale, right? You know, when you've got a hundred thousand ballots sitting in a pile and you don't know what's in it, you know, you, you've got to get teams of two, you got to sift through everything, you've got to get people to look at that, and you know, there's a reason why there's voting systems in the world. It's because hand counting ballots is not. The, the most optimal way to do it, right? It's not the most reliable way. So doing these, you know, using equipment to filter up the anomalies, to show you guys the math behind our calculations, and not to, not to try to do anything with them, but to, to basically present them and say, you, you probably want to be aware of this. You know, how would you like to handle this? That's what you want in, in, in close, com close you know, situations because it now gives you, it empowers you and it puts the control back in your hands to say, this is what's out there. You know, how do you guys want to deal with this? Right? Um, the next thing, to your point, you know, we don't just show you the votes and the overvotes, but we also show you every other ballot that we counted where that candidate did not receive a vote. And you know, again, in close contests, this is where you know votes can be can be switched. What we do here is we, we give you the ability to filter any density in this candidate area to the top. So if I click on sort for uncaptured intent, it's going to repurpose this, and it's going to anything where there was a circle or somebody made a mark in that area, it's going to filter it up. You know, so now you guys can see, okay. Look at all this stuff that, that, that the machine didn't count. You know, nobody saw. It's not a vote. It's not an overvote. It's not anything. But what do I want to do with this? It, you know. So, so the machine wouldn't catch the overvote. The ticket back before they fill out. This is primarily in vote by mail. So yeah, okay. if it, it's passed through there, yeah. it will kick it out. Okay. But you know, as you guys can kind of grow in your vote by mail, you know, you're going to see more and more of this. So. And you know, situation, I don't know if I've got a good example of, of one on here. Well, this might be a good example. So one of the things we see a lot of in the vote by mail space, and not, and not just in vote by mail, but in, in precinct voting too, is where you know, the voter circles the candidate's name. Uh, now, if they don't hit the oval, we're not going to count that as a vote. But we don't kick out undervotes. We kick out blank ballots. And it only takes one oval to be passed through with that circle. It's not a blank ballot anymore. Right? So if I go through and I circle all the contests on here, but on one of those ovals, I catch 
a little bit of that circle, the system's going to read that as a vote. And it'll it'll pass it through and say, oh, I can't we'll vote on this ballot. So with our system, you know, that would be a, a, a clear a clear example of voter intent because the consistency of the voter marks is, is, is part of the you know part of the what you look at, right? Uh, and if they're consistent on the voters' marks and you know they've circled everything and only one catches that, you know, you may not see that unless you've got this kind of visualization. So that's why you know we've developed this system the way we did. And that's really what our clients find the most valuable. Because, you know, I'm not going to say that any of the systems in this room or any of the voting systems in the country are, are, are inaccurate. But I will say that we provide transparency, which allows you guys to be more precise. And, you know, as elections are getting closer and closer and, and, and the scrutiny on them is getting tighter and tighter, it's better you have this type of evidence than not have it. That's my spiel. Any questions? Is there a requirement then, I guess, to follow up the mechanism for verifying actual ballots? Um, yeah, so we have, with every ballot image that so, so if you look up here, uh, I don't know if this is. We've got a, a ballot ID, a digital ID image in there. So, so every image that's created, we, we create a name. So this ballot is early voting, box nine, and this is ballot 1,281. Now if it's, if it's in, uh, voted by mail or early voting where, um, where they're in order, you'll be able to find that ballot pretty easily. If, if, if they're not in order and in the precincts, usually our system randomizes it. I think all the systems have to randomize the ballots. Uh, you probably would have to rescan, and, and that's another thing that you can do with our system. So, let's say you know you, you wanted to find a ballot like this, but it was in a box that was randomized, and you couldn't unless you wanted to go through. If you didn't want to go and you know look for it, what you could do is delete this box, rescan the box through one of the, the high-speed scanners, and then those ballots would be in a specific order, and you would be able to, you know, you'd be able to find them. Uh, you know, don't do that. And that's like, I don't know if you guys have, you know, I unfortunately know way more about post-election audits than I ever thought I would, but if you guys have heard of risk-limiting audits and stuff like that, currently, you know, risk limiting audits are, are, are the way that they're prescribed are impossible to do in a precinct environment because they require ballots to be, you know, in a specific order. Um, so the best you can do is a batch level audit, which is kind of like a, a you know, fixed percentage of the totals that you compare against, you know, one another. Um, but, you know, We've been working in a lot of places where they have compared risk limiting audits with fixed percentage audits with our system. The whole principle behind risk limiting audits is statistical confidence based off a sampling of like hand comparisons. And you know, what we say is, would you rather have empirical confidence because you're able to view and visualize every you know, voted mark in every contest in a way that makes sense? rather than just taking six ballots or 60 ballots out of a hundred thousand and saying, okay. So we actually do uh, uh, state level audits in Vermont and uh, in the state of Maryland, uh, where they compare. I'm going to pause folks you know, for just a moment if I could. We, this officially ends this uh, demonstration period, but I know that the vendors have been willing to stick around talk with folks. I just want to mind, make everyone mindful that we'll do a whole new session of rotation starting at 4 o'clock and you'll just be mindful that they may need to reset before the 4 o'clock time period and maybe take a momentary break because they've been doing this as long as you guys have. So thank you for coming and being a part of the demonstrations and if you didn't get all your questions answered, stick around. We'll do it again at 4 o'clock. Okay. Were you part of Tuesday's Scott, were you part of the Tuesday voting?
No, no, we're not. We're, we just got certified in North Carolina, so we didn't get a chance to participate this year. So, how do you answer the claim that they could, uh, a hacker could, um, get in between, I guess, uh, the driver? That was that thing on clear ballot paper. The driver? Yeah, I guess the driver of the scanner, like before the ballot is. Um, off here, but before the ballot is is put in, it's scanned. But before it's saved on your media, somebody modifies it. I guess that was the point. Of the uh, yeah, I mean it's it's hard to disprove a negative, but I mean anything is possible. I assume, but you, that would assume that you have that you have to break into our system, introduce code that doesn't you know freeze the machine up without anybody knowing. It's 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 a little bit of a okay. far fetched yeah, idea, kind of but far fetched in a. In a so and, and, and at the end of the day, if, if, if you think that's happened, yeah. and, and there will be evidence of it, you have the paper ballots right. that you can go back and compare it to. Now, do you put barcodes on your no. ballots? You don't. No. Um, and so you said you put a, you have a, you, a randomization. Is that a randomization of the images? Yes. Okay, so you randomize the images so that they don't match the paper, so no one can know which Correct. one is which. Uh, but you said you have a, a unique... Uh, na um, identifier right. on the image itself. Right. Those those are the are what are randomized. The, and the that does not correspond to something printed on the ballot. No, there isn't not. anything on the ballot. Nope. That's, okay, so there's nothing that would identify that specific ballot. And that's maybe. So we don't difficult. add anything or take anything away from the ballot okay. or the ballot image, other than just assigning a name to the file. If that makes sense. So, in terms of the idea of, for risk limiting audits, the, the ballot comparison type, where they have to go retrieve a specific ballot, right? Difficult, right? Because you don't have an identifier on it, right? Uh, but I will say this: I know that the you only can do place risk that we can limiting batch audits. Yeah, yeah. And those are still can be risk limiting. They don't have to be. Yeah, it's fixed, a risk. Yeah, they don't have to be fixed percentage. The only place where in a, in a precinct environment where where you can actually do a true comparison risk limiting audit is in the counties that we're working with in Florida right now because what in Florida what they do is they run the ballots through their primary voting system but then they rescan every ballot once they come back into the office and then they're kept in order coming off our high speed scanners but you don't and those high speed scanners are not imprinting an no. identifier even no but they but because they're keeping in order they don't they don't need to so our cast vote record is is essentially a ballot census, right? Yeah, if you go in if you can count to that ballot you can find it that way. It's pretty you can actually and you can actually take the box, you know, off you can take the ballots out of the box, put it on the scanner and program in the ballot number and it'll stop on there. Mm. So so and and because we I don't know how familiar you are with us, but we you know, we we were the first technology you know, I, to I've, produce I've seen your other the other auditing um, you know, your solution for auditing. Yeah, I've seen the video of that. Yeah, we were the first company to produce a cast vote record because we were working with the guys that you know started doing the risk limiting audit. All the other voting systems have adopted that now, but um, but our cast vote record will in in the counties we work with in Florida identically matches the the way that the ballots are stored, which is so we're actually working now, with them closely. Are now you the, getting the, the sort of the ballot image audit? Uh, I think Maryland was doing that. Maryland's doing the ballot image audit. Yeah. Um, do you have a way to validate the images? Just to, I guess they want to compare them with the paper, just to make sure that they were that they're the right thing. Uh, well, we do it. So what we do is we we audit the ballot images, and then we do a comparison against the primary voting system, right? So we're doing a comparison of By the results. Auditing the ballot images means you take the ballot images from the from the actual scanners that we're using in the yes. election. You're not rescanning them. Right. Okay. That that's what allows us to do four and a half million pieces of paper in a week. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're using the ballot hey, images hey, that you're reading. Hey, good seeing you, Dana. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know what I'm yeah. doing. <laughs> no, I've, I've well, worked a lot with the, the risk limiting audit people. Yeah. yeah. And, and actually, I'll tell you, they have a weakness in the risk limiting audit, and that is that if you have a whole bunch of races, a plethora of small races, like school districts, like yeah. they're all they don't overlap. And so if you're going to risk limit the school district races, you have to then get a sample of that specific school district. Right. And 
it's not based on how many ballots are in it, it's on the yeah. margin. So if you have a close margin in a small race, you still have to get a lot of ballots. I know. So and that's, I mean, we've been work. I, I want to work with yeah. the verified voting people and the RLA people, but like it's, you know, our clients are the ones that are like, eh. Yeah. Well, they, you know, they're, for the really consequential races, like presidential, maybe the senators of the state, now you maybe do risk limiting audit but that their way. Yeah. When you get down to those small races, there's no way. But that's a, and but that's the thing though. I mean, doing it by race is is tough. You know, especially for for folks. You know, what happens if there's multiple, you know, multiple races? You well, know, are you going to have to sift through and find the, well, they, they're, you know, they're targeting, separate RLAs they're targeting for sta separate statewide and countywide? That's what they're doing in Colorado. Yeah. They do one statewide race and one countywide race. And then they're hoping that that will cover a yeah. lot of the other races. Well, it, it will cover count, count, other statewide races that have a lower margin because those are not going to take so many samples. But, and, and also countywide. But when you get down to those individual small races like that, you know, school board or something, um, they're not going to get enough ballots for any kind of risk limit if they're going to hold it to it. Right. And then you have to say that, well, maybe those are not that consequential. What hacker is going to go in and do it? And then your solution of uh, looking at the images is, is uh, viable because the only thing that that one unclear ballot thing that I wrote was is they claimed that between your, I guess, the, the driver concept that somebody could hack into the driver and change the image, move the box around. You talking about the Alex Alderman article? I don't article? know who did it. Yeah. I, that they would move the box. I mean, it's possible to move that box. You'd have to know. Now, do you randomize? You were able to randomize the order of the con, con, uh, the options in the contest uh, according to a random um, alphabet? No. You don't do the random alphabet? No, well, I mean, not unless you, it's required to know what, what style ballot it is. What what kind of like, which which contests are on the ballot when you're scanning. Because we've created the ballot styles. And then when you scan the ballot, how would you know that? Could this scanner scan any, any yeah, it's, style? Yeah, it's native, right? So anything that comes in that's, that's not native to the system, it's going to reject. So know, if anybody if manipulates created, a ballot, ballot, style, ballot but let's anybody say, manipulates a ballot style, that's going to be rejected. Okay, but listen. So that's why that's how we're able to protect against it. Right. I mean, let's say that, that you have one one person that includes school district A, the other one that doesn't include school district A on their ballot. Then, um, how would you know the difference between one ballot and the other that has that contest on it? You know, how, how do you do know that? the difference between twin children? You well, know, I know they, uh, these if people you've created here, them, they have a barcode on it to, to know say what style it is, what style ballot. Yeah, we do. We have ballot styles on our. Okay, so you write them yeah. on there. Somewhere. Okay, so you, you can just your machine says, okay, I know what style this is. Yeah. And is it unlimited styles? Because I know the ESNS is yeah. only limited to forty. Oh no, we we can do. Like I said, I think we have seventy-five thousand unique PDFs that we can you know that we can run in an election. In a jurisdiction, seventy-five thousand. So seventy-five thousand ballot images. Seventy-five thousand unique ballot types. Yeah, orientations. Yeah. that's probably enough for most. Most. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I think that was King County is what they use. So. Oh really? Wow. Yeah. Because I have never heard of that many different styles. Yeah. And then you don't have an upper limit to how many ballots you can process. Or you can do on that. As far as the no, no, I mean we've. I mean, we did 4.5 million in Maryland, so that oh, was, yeah. I think That's that was the, big. that was the largest uh, image. Now, did you work with, in Maryland, uh, you're not doing the ballot, the precinct thing, it's, it's a ballot, it's a handmarked paper ballots is what they're using there? They use handmarked paper ballots and express vote uh, ballot that. summary cards. Oh, the summary cards, okay. Yeah. And then you're getting those images and processing those. Yeah. And you just take the images as is, you're not re-scanning anything in that. We just take the images as is, yeah. Okay. okay, good. Well, thank you very much for your next thank questions. You. And have fun in your next Appreciate <laughs> three cents. <it. laughs> yeah.